Uh, we want to welcome you to this fifth in our series of theological e-forums, uh, the progressive Christian movement during times of crisis and transformation. We have uh, been blessed to be able to uh, gather community for these previous four and now five weeks and uh, plan to be doing that in the coming weeks as well. We have uh, other faculty and staff who are co-leading future upcoming sessions. We have been reflecting on uh, what it is to be faith community in this particular time and in these particular places. And so uh, tonight we are extremely uh, thankful to be able to welcome um, our own music director from Eden Seminary, Paul Vasili, who uh, has been co-leading some of our chapel services during this time of uh, pandemic and when our campus is closed in person, but we are gathering online. Uh, Paul is the executive director also of the group Music That Makes Community. And he is joined by two colleagues, uh, Sarah Barizzi, Bariza, uh, who serves as the Minister for Music at the First Congregational Church of St. Louis. Uh, Sarah is a theologian and a musician and full-time does this kind of reflection on uh, the way we make music and the theology around it. And Tony McNeil, is with us as well. And Tony is joining us from Rock Hill, South Carolina, where he serves as the director of um, vocal music for that historical black college that is related to the AME Zion Church. And so we are very grateful to all of you uh, for sharing in the leadership today. I would remind you um, or let you know if this is your first time joining us on one of these e-forums that we do question and answer uh, via the chat. So if during the time of presentation you have uh, something that comes to your mind or you would like to make a chat, uh, go ahead and write it in there and we will try to gather some of those at the end of the presentation to uh, respond and help uh, your participation as far to part of that. And so with that, I would invite you all into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Oh, resurrection God, your newness fills us, surprises us, empowers us. Be with this scattered gathering. Form us as your presence and action in the world Accept the praise we sing. Amen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Welcome, friends. It's a gift to be together. It is the Easter season. And so we said we were, we're offering virtual hallelujahs. Well, let's practice singing together. Friends, you're on mute and you'll stay on mute. But I'm going to sing uh, and then I'm going to invite you to join me. But listen first, this is a, a, an alleluia that comes from George Makadana in South Africa. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. Listen first and echo after me. Alleluia, Alleluia. Sing with me. Alleluia, Alleluia. Now listen. Alleluia. Alleluia, and sing with me. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. 
sing hallelujah hallelujah friends i'll help you out watch me and let's sing one more time together hallelujah 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 Amen. Friends, to sing together in this digital way is requiring some real creativity to worship, to be the body of Christ in this time of COVID-19 is requiring a lot of imagination and creativity. And so today I am just so delighted to bring alongside two musicians who I see doing important work as good listeners, as good watchers as noticers of what's happening in the church and how folks are figuring out how to make community through their voices. Um, we take for granted perhaps that we actually get to hear and feel each other when we're in worship together. And we may not get that same experience while on Zoom or Facebook Live, but what I've been noticing is that we actually can still feel connected in some way. And I do believe that when Christ said where two or three are gathered, I am there in the midst of them, that, that that might even include online worship. Actually, I'm pretty sure it does include online worship. Friends, so we're going to dive into what we're noticing, what we're experiencing, what we're seeing. And I want to guess start with Tony and say, Tony, uh, you've been uh, working in the church, you've been connected in many different spaces, especially in African American congregations. Um, where and what are you seeing right now? How are folks inviting their communities? And, and but first of all, tell us a little about yourself, but then friend, where are you noticing online worship and singing happening? And how is that happening in the communities that you're watching? Oh, okay. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Okay, very good. Want to make sure. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Tony McNeil. I serve as the director of choral activities at Clinton College. Clinton College, located in Rock Hill, South Carolina. It is aligned with the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, also known as the AME Zion Church. And at Clinton College, I, um, I lead the Clinton College Choir. I teach um, uh, uh, music appreciation. I've taught music appreciation. Uh, this semester, I'm also teaching uh, a course in hymnology. And I'm also uh, charged with the exciting responsibility for cultivating a department of music at a school where a department of music does, uh, now does not exist. And so it's hard work, but it's also exciting work. Um, so uh, as a result of my commitment to the college, I'm not committed currently right now to a local congregation um, where I'm leading worship or serving um, a particular uh, church every single Sunday, but I am in communication um, with a number of uh, music ministers and pastors and worship leaders, uh, church musicians who, are, who do serve uh, the local church. And I spent a lot of time consulting and um, curating space for conversation and helping folks um, with worship planning uh, and all those kinds of things. So um, as far as I'm concerned, um, Paul, from what I'm seeing, especially um, on the landscape of African-American worship, I'm seeing a variety of things. I'm seeing a variety of exciting things, and I'm also seeing a lot of things that concern me. Um, I'm seeing um, a lot of innovative um, approaches to worship um, that involve uh, hybrid kinds of things where um, there's a combination of recorded uh, segments and live segments. I see um, pastors who are preaching from their dinner tables, um, 
while having uh, inter, um, interconnected with what they're doing, uh, recorded or, um, segments of worship uh, with one person or maybe a small group of people. I'm also seeing some in-person worship um, where folks are gathered in the space where they normally would gather for, um, for Sunday worship or Saturday worship. And um, it's, it, I, I've seen a variety, uh, I've seen that manifest in a variety of ways um, from where there's just a preacher and a singer or a preacher and a singer and a musician or a pastor, a worship leader, a team of musicians, and in some instances, some choirs uh, or small groups of choirs, um, which for me causes alarm um, for, um, from a health standpoint. I'm also seeing um, the use of virtual um, choirs. Um, that, that's um, something that is uh, becoming more and more popular where uh, music ministers and musicians are um, rallying a team of singer, their singers, if not their full choir, maybe a small represent, representation of their choirs uh, or from their ministry to um, create this virtual choir experience that is either, uh, that's pre-recorded and um, usually shown in the worship space. Um, it's, 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 it's a whole lot of things that I'm seeing. I spend my Sunday mornings church hopping um, and just going from worship space to worship space, big church, little church, small church. And I, I'm seeing uh, different kinds of things being manifest of, across the country. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, a lot of things that are happening good, but there are a lot of things that I am concerned about, especially uh, when it comes to the health and safety uh, of people uh, who are charged to lead, lead worship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tony. I appreciate that. Sarah, you're in a slightly different space. You're actually serving an, a congregation here in the St. Louis area. Tell us about your work and tell us what you're doing. How are you inviting your congregation into song or what are you, what are you engaged in in this time? Yeah, so I'm the minister of music at the First Congregational Church of St. Louis. I've been here for almost two years and I've been a church musician ministering churches for a little bit over 20, this, 20 years this year. And, and I, I joke, I've worked in all the major, all, all the denominations that hire an organist, a classically trained organist, I've worked there. And so I am seeing a lot of, from all the people that I know over the years, all the people that I'm connected with, I'm seeing such a, such an emotional range and such a range of support or not support from the churches that they work in and value or not value for music and musicians in the churches that, that I'm seeing. I'm really active in the online spaces for church musicians, Facebook groups. I love them constantly seeing what are people doing? What are they interested in? What are they trying? What are they failing at? And I'm seeing so many musicians who've been furloughed, whose jobs have been like they're terminated at this point, who are told by ministers, what you're doing doesn't matter. Um, the legality of this doesn't matter. Uh, you need to come in and risk your health, those kinds of things. And I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of difficulty over how to respond to those kinds of things, how to respond financially, how to respond emotionally to a pastoral, uh, a boss, a supervisor who's saying you got to do this or you're not employed, that kind of thing. Very tricky. Um, I'm also seeing, as, as Tony said, so much innovation um it's it's one of those things where i don't want to i don't want to put a sheen on things i don't want to say look here's this silver lining um but as i'm often explaining to my three-year-old this is a hard time and it can be bittersweet and we can have sweet things with the bitter and some of the sweet things that i'm seeing alongside the really terrible are this creativity this energy this this interest in expanding skill sets without a fear of failure. I think so often we are so afraid of failing and what are people gonna think? And that cranky old lady in the back row is gonna be cranky at me and I'm gonna have to deal with that. And you know what? Congregations right now, as far as I can tell, are being really forgiving and really generous, very grace giving. And so what I'm seeing for musicians is this response of, oh, I can try something and I can fail and people aren't gonna be really upset at me. And there's the sweet alongside the bitter. 
Wow. Yeah. Thank you very much for noticing that, that, that friends with any major change in our life together, especially around what happens on Sunday morning, which as we know is such a very, very central piece of how Christians connect, how we, how we uh, express and enact our faith. It's not just getting together. It's forming us in the way of Christ. It's making us into uh, the people that God has called us to be. Um, that, that, yeah, this, this, this kind of seismic, if you will, change can be huge. I've been really interesting working here at the seminary. We've been making worship two to three times a week. And I've been so grateful for my colleague here, Dr. Grundy, who has been very encouraging to try to figure out how, as you know, a seminary is a place of pluralistic connection. We're, we're not all the same here denominationally, ethnically, racially, culturally. We're quite a broad spectrum. But how can we, even within that difference, find some common practices, some rituals that ground us in our faith? And wondering how music, in, in our case, we have become very consistent. Um, whereas many congregations I've served would be uh, uninterested in singing the same piece each time they gather. We've noticed that as we've sung, there's a spirit of love in this place by Mark Miller. Each time we've gathered, the, as as Dr. Grundy and I have been in conversation with each other, is it time for this piece to move on? Is it time to move on? Each time we engage it, it feels somehow necessary and needed and fruitful for the setting the tone of what we're making together as a community. Um, online, I've been worshiping with several worshiping communities of different sizes, as both of you have, and, sh and shapes and configurations. And one of the things I've noticed is that the service has, and music in the service has generally been reduced in scope, but its importance is even more heightened as a piece of, uh, as Robert Weber talks about it, the wheel on which the word and the Eucharist ride, that thing that energizes and connects and orients us in a worship space, and especially online. Um, some very interesting challenges and also possibilities that exist in, in repertoires and ways that we can incorporate and use uh, repetition in our worship spaces and what that might look like. And friends, those are, those are things, as you said, Sarah, that are not as common in our Sunday to Sunday in our, uh, in our worship times and spaces. Friends, I wonder about choirs. Uh, you mentioned earlier, Tony, you mentioned choirs and worship ensembles. Um, how are you seeing them show up in uh, online worship? Sarah, you're, I know you are actually, you've done an online choir. You've done a virtual choir with your choir. Talk a little bit about that. What's that been like for you? And how's that been helpful? Has it been hard? Um, and, and then Dr. Tony, I'd love to hear you speak too about what you're noticing in choirs and especially worship bands and ensembles. Mm -hmm. In the broader scheme of things, I'm seeing a lot of part-time church musicians frustrated by virtual choirs because they're so time consuming to put on. And so pastor so-and-so sends the organist, hey, you should do this, this is so cool. And they're like, I, I can't, like I work full-time doing this other thing, this is cool. And it, you're asking me to do 80 hours of work for three minutes of music, I can't do this. And and I'm seeing frustration around that. I'm also seeing, um, seeing uh, innovation around that. Um, people are exper experimenting with apps. I have done a much lower tech version of virtual choir where we all lip synced with a Zoom call. So I spent a lot of time editing audio for it and made the audio sound good. But in terms of the video and what that would require my colleagues to do in terms of editing, the time commitment, you know, they're doing virtual services right now. They don't have time to edit a, a choir thing on top of it. But lip syncing with a Zoom call, not so bad, we could make that happen. Um, what I'm seeing in terms of choir, and I'm, this is based off of my own choir members, but I can imagine this might be the case for other choirs. I'm seeing for even the professionals in my choir, how scary this kind of thing is, where you know, you're listening to somebody's accompaniment track in your ears, and then you're singing by yourself into your phone, which by the way, doesn't pick up a fabulous sound. And then you listen back and you're like, I sound like that, you know? And so, and then, you know, I put it together and it sounds pretty good. But what I'm seeing is bravery in the face of going, oh, this, 
this isn't pretty. I don't look good on camera and still being willing to send that to me and still being willing to like let people in on that kind of like, this is hard. This is scary. You know, that's a lot of bravery that we require even for in-person singing. You know, in-person singing is hard. We're making our bodies vulnerable to each other. And now let's do it on this little bitty audio file that you're going to send off to your choir director. Yeah. It's very interesting that, that, that notice, I want to notice that word bravery or courage or vulnerability and how that shows up. Friends, that's a powerful, powerful word um, that we are inviting our congregations, all of us, and including us as leaders into walking a, a bit of a tightrope of something we've never done before, of making something for the first time ever. Um, that we are, as leaders, uh, inviting an incredible space of risk-taking, which is not necessarily what it may feel like if you're in the choir and you're next to eight other altos and singing along with them and not the solo voice, if that makes sense. So, Tony, what else are you noticing around choirs, worship ensembles? How are they engaging and, and, and in, invited in? Well, the, the, the key thing that I look for um, Paul, as I observe worship services, is the, the substance of uh, the text of the songs that uh, worship leaders are choosing, especially in this day and age. I am noticing that regardless of how many people may be there to lead the singing, uh, songs are, uh, uh, the majority of the songs that worship leaders are, are, are choosing uh, are more simplistic in nature, um, more congregationally rooted. Um, and I don't know if that is in an effort to get more people to, to sing along. Um, I, am, I, am, I am seeing seeing some worship leaders who are intentional about inviting people into the, uh, the worship experience, even though they cannot see them or get feedback from them. Uh, and uh, I think that's necessary uh, so that people don't uh, take on the posture of, okay, I'm clicking on this experience for um, the people that are at the church to do this for me. No, we need to be reminded that we, we need to still invite our congregations into the experience, uh, that the distance does not... Um, preclude them from not participating. So um, I, I'm, I'm very happy when I, I see the intentionality of bringing people into, this, into the singing, but I'm seeing more simplistic song selection. Um, and that for me is a good thing if the songs are substantive and if the songs are appropriate for the day and if the songs speak to what's needed in the, in the worship uh, service. I, I'm also seeing um, examples where some worship leaders are choosing songs for their choirs or ensembles um, that don't fit, that they're just filling slots. Um, and, you know, let's just sing a fast song here just because we need a fast song. Or let's just, uh, you know, we have to sing a hymn, so let's randomly pick a hymn. Um, and I challenge the ones that I am in conversation with to not let a tempo marking or an ethos, a certain ethos, drive your selection of songs. Yes. At the end of the day, people need to hear proclamation. Um, and uh, I, am, I am thrilled when I, I see intentionality um, by those who make decisions for worship um, to stay true to the text and find texts that are appropriate, but that are yet singable and memorable um, and inviting for, for congregations. So um, I, I'm seeing that and, and I'm seeing the let's stand up, let's sing and let's sit down kind of thing. So, so there are a couple of things there that I'm noticing and they're really, really helpful. One that, that you named so clearly is um, integrity and authenticity, how we express our heartfelt praise and prayer in a time when the world seems to be quite uh, undone. And the words that we offer to our communities are valuable, they're important. And what we invite congregations to sing, even if we can't hear them, 
still matters deeply. Um, I'm also hearing, Sarah, you say that context, knowing how much time you have to give, how many people you have to work with, what their level of comfort is with technology. I've engaged with some, some musicians who said, my choir is not comfortable singing into their phone and they are not tech savvy in a way that they could do that. So what are other options? What are other ways that they can be engaged or involved? No one size fits all um, as far as what's happening. Um, I, I wonder about, in particular, about this idea of, as you were saying, Tony, uh, invitation, worship is not a spectator sport. But indeed, what happens when a leader in an in online worship service or in person says, it matters that you sing with me now, come on and join me and is intentional about making that invitation. That's one place I have a little bit of fear and, and concern around what we're doing online because hospitality matters. Um, and as we think about a, a theology of welcome, especially around worship, many people are tuning in who have not been in worship for some time or have not had access to worship, perhaps, in our spaces. Do we sing in a way that assumes they know all the words and the, and the tunes? Or do we actually find ways to, as I've been doing with Music That Makes Community, practice teaching, practice sharing, call, echo, call and echo. And even if we can't exactly hear each other, the welcome in feels really important somehow. Um, could you both even say a little bit more about welcome in that way or hospitality or theologies of hospitality and, and connection through music? I think one of the, oh, I'm sorry. I, I think oh, one of the, the best expressions of hospitality is effective planning. Um, I, um, and planning with a, a, a bigger sense of the audience that um, you now have access to, not only um, the people that you are familiar uh, with on a weekly basis, but there are now new people that are emerging that are, uh, you know, web surfing and who may stumble upon your worship service. Like you said, persons who are unchurched, persons who haven't been in a church in a long time. And because, you know, we're at home and, uh, they have their iPad there, they decide to come to your, your, your uh, live stream. Do you have the uh, resources available for someone who has never been in church or someone who hasn't been in church in a long time to come in and actually feel like they can become a part of your worship service? Or do you take for granted that everybody knows the words? Or do you take for granted that you know, people know the handshake of your congregation. Um, I, and I think that this opportunity of, of worshiping online is giving worship leaders, or I hope it is, a wider scope, a wider uh, view of their leadership and the kinds of things that they need to think about and words they need to say um, that don't, um, you know, push people off into the margins. Just the other day, I was in a conversation with, with some friends who worship on Zoom, and they were saying, we keep playing in our congregation with ways to think about telling people to mute themselves graciously, lovingly. <laughs> okay, friends, let's hop on Zoom, uh, rather than, okay, mute yourselves. Uh, what are ways that feel both inviting, gracious, generous, and kind? Because friends, those are words that matter in person and online too, right? So our digital language matters. Sarah, you were going to say something about hospitality, please. Yeah, I'm thinking about body language and how when we are worshiping in a larger space, um, especially on the bigger end of sizes of church buildings, you can't really see really detailed facial expression or maybe like me, the organist is hidden behind a wall and you never know where the sound is coming from and you don't have anyone telling you to start singing, the music just starts. When we're doing all these online worship experiences, whether that's pre-recorded or live, we can look at the camera and I, I have glasses on, so I'm not sure if you can tell. I've been filming actually for um, the videos that I'm making for church. I'm filming and I'm trying to look directly into the camera on my computer. I don't know if you can tell that difference because when we are, when we're using this kind of space, we can intentionally change our body language into that welcoming thing 
we can look at you know look in somebody's eye i mean we're, we're not actually obviously it's one-sided but we can perform that body language in a way that is welcoming to people kind of like you know you're in theater but now you're in movie mode and i don't want to say that in a, like an artifice kind of way but just in the like you know hey i'm i'm talking at you from 12 inches I can do something with my body language there that is more welcoming. Absolutely. I, I've been noticing in our online spaces, especially as I'm thinking about our choir rehearsals, I've been the, the pleasure of going online with our choir here at Eden and with about a dozen 13, 14 folk making a rehearsal much like I see you all laid out here on my screen. And I'm noticing myself paying very careful attention to your faces in different ways than I might in worship, we don't get to see each other's faces unless we worship in the round. So this is changing something about the way we're engaging with facial cueing and welcome. And um, I've also been playing around in worship spaces and when watching churches do work with hands and movement. Uh, Christ be with me, Christ above me, Christ behind me, Christ to the right of me, however it is. Friends, that, that we can actually even use our body language and our bodies, even in seated space. So this is a welcome space, I think, for many, many folks on a spectrum of, of abilities um, and ages to engage even their bodies in worship. Who knew that online worship might actually give us some permission or space to start engaging other modalities of, of connection to meaning making that are not just our voices but are, are connected in deep, deep ways. Wonderful. I, I want to move on, and I, I guess I want to ask a question next of the two of you, and, and this is an important one. What skill or skills are you finding indispensable for online music leadership? If, if you could pare it down, I mean, this is a hard question, but what is the skill or set of skills that are coming together that make online worship that are helping it happen and, and, and allowing it to, to be alive and vibrant in ways that you've seen. Sarah? I think curiosity paired with self-knowledge of what I or any church musician has the time for and the skill set for. And those are not, you know, skill is not the same as time. Time is not the same as skill, but self-awareness of like, how much time can I commit? Am I even able to learn that tricky cool new software that looks so amazing but that's tricky and just being curious about what other people are doing not because i have to do it because i have to do what they're doing but because it's interesting and i want to see what my brothers and sisters are doing mm, curiosity as a skill cultivating curiosity uh friends i don't know about you but there is a oh, we've got someone sharing our sharing their screen with us all right exciting <laughs> Friends, I, uh, I wonder in terms of uh, thinking that we don't, we, curiosity as a skill, we don't often think of it as a skill, but cultivating uh, wonder and curiosity, even in a time when we might be tempted, Sarah, to get rigid and have to fix things and have to, to be, uh, be the uh, go-to handy person in the, in the music life or the liturgical or, life or just the panic and go oh this is so scary i can't do anything yep <laughs> around yep. in a circle tony how about you what's a, a a skill that or tool you're finding indispensable for online worship for me um having a commitment to pregnant brevity uh and what i mean by pregnant brevity uh is because um i, I say that um because of the attention span people have for online worship. And I, I'm concerned that people who normally have um, a one hour or one and a half hour worship spirit experience are still trying to recreate that online when people are at home where they're most vulnerable and tend to you know, gravitate to other things very easily. Um, my recommendation has been for um, my uh, folks that I've been talking to, uh, cut the time in half. If you, could, if you could say everything that you would have said uh, or needed, need to say in a one and a half hour or one hour experience in 30 minutes or 20 minutes, um, and it's packed with sub substance, organization, clarity, 
welcome. Um, I, I think that can be just as effective as a two hour worship service, if it's planned well. Uh, and so this, this understanding that um, people will come to worship in a, in a different um, a, a mode of engagement than they uh, probably would if they were in person. But this commitment to pregnant brevity, um, I think is, is, is something that could, should be considered. Thank you. You know, last week we had an incredible model of that here. We had our, our uh, Black Alumni Association offered a seven last words in the African-American preaching tradition. And it was each preacher preached maybe three to four minutes wow. per word. And, and uh, Dr. Tony, I highly recommend everyone here might go to actually view this again. It's, it's uh, archived from last week. For me, it was a powerful experience of church that had, again, a musical component almost to it in the pacing and the rhythm of the preaching and the, also the feedback of us and our bodies. You could see people responding in the boxes, in their little box. Uh, everyone was moving around. But friends, that there was an incredible sense of planning, purposefulness, and organization. Online worship is asking us, what matters right now? What is essential? What are the things that make worship connecting and important that lead to, I think, engagement and, um, and the fluff or the sense of extra is, sometime, is somehow not going to translate uh, in, in an online space? And by fluff, I don't mean to be uh, denigrating any of our customs or traditions that are, um, that, that are important to us when we gather, but we are being asked to, to economize and to focus. Some really great comments that are showing up, I might add, if folks are looking in the chat bar, um, also asking questions about accessibility, about uh, deaf and, and uh, hearing impaired folk and how folks might also be connecting to worship visually through sign language or ASL interpretation. Um, other forms of embodiment. Thank you, friends, for really capturing beautiful, there's some beautiful conversation and texture happening there. Friends, I want to ask maybe one uh, other question before we turn to some uh, of the questions here from this community or go fold back, but what, um, maybe can I ask you, what are you finding challenging uh, or uncomfortable in this space of making online worship right now? Where are you finding in yourself and maybe even as you're listening around the edges to your colleagues and those you're consulting with and working with where are you finding dissonances and, and resistances and challenges because those are holy i want to name that those are actually holy important god god given things that we need to be in relationship with what are you noticing and tony maybe start with you you mentioned earlier a dissonance around space and too many people in a space but what other things Absolutely, Paul. Um, you know, on the onset of uh, everything shutting down, um, I, I notice online, especially on Facebook, the emergence of an abundance of opportunities to learn how to stream worship services, especially for churches, uh, especially for smaller churches who, who've never done it before. Um, and so one of the challenges has been the learning curve of how to do this and how to do it well. Um, and people are still getting the hang of it. Um, there's all kinds of um, ideas and methodologies out there that people are exploring and people are pushing. But, um, you know, for uh, leadership that has been resistant to um, you know, getting into the wave of online worship. They've been thrown into the fiery furnace, if you will, of technology. And, um, and it's frustrated a lot of churches and a lot of pastors who don't normally you know, want to be in front of an iPad. They want to be in front of their people. And so finding resources, finding people online, who um, can teach with the care and hospitality and patience that's needed for Great. persons uh, who fall in that category has been uh, refreshing to see. And one person in particular uh, that I would like to laud for that is Reverend uh, Timothy Farmer. 
Uh, he is uh, what he calls a techno evangelist uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and he's been doing some incredible webinars, all free. And I encourage you to, uh, to look him up, Timothy Farmer. Uh, and on Facebook, uh, he has on a red jacket because uh, he's a member of Kappa Alpha Psi. Um, so uh, you can identify him by the uh, bright red jacket that he has. Follow him. Uh, look on his Facebook page for uh, tutorials. And Tim, Tim teaches in a way that is accessible for uh, the person who is afraid to try this. He has that person in mind when he's teaching. Uh, and I love going to his webinars and just watching him uh, make the uh, most complex tasks seem very, very easy. Um, another person I want to um, encourage people to follow um, is Reverend Dr. Martha Simmons, who uh, does a series of webinars um, every other week called Preaching and Preachers. Uh, and she has dedicated a lot of time uh, in the past weeks um, helping churches to come on board and churches that are already on board, how to do it better. And uh, I've been very grateful and a lot of people have benefited from um, the kinds of things that uh, Dr. Uh, Martha Simmons and Reverend Timothy Farmer have been providing. Thank you so much. Uh, that's fantastic to know that there are folks out there who are, when friends, that anxiety, that dissonance, that challenge, that, that um, as you said, the fiery furnace of new technology, new tasks, Absolutely. to have folks who are patient enough to walk us through it and who give us the grace to say, we're going to keep trying and not give up. Uh, that tenacity matters in this particular moment with our singing, with our preaching. Um, a, we're going to get up and try it all over again today. Um, Sarah, again, what are you noticing as far as challenging challenges or discomforts or things that, that you're, you've been engaging in your work and with colleagues and friends? I think I'm finding pastoring, being pastoral to be really challenging right now. And I don't think I'm the only only person experiencing that. I think often we, we are able to minister out of abundance. We're out of, able to minister out of a, a full well. And I know I'm not the only person who's finding this really, really hard. And the emotional labor of this really hard, the family care really hard. And I'm still ministering, especially to the, the small group that is my choir, the, the musicians that are kind of under my umbrella at the church. It's really hard to minister to people in a difficult place when you're also going through a difficult place. And, you know, it's, it's the journey I'm walking through right now. And it's making me think in a broader sense about, especially in the mainland, how churches often don't consider their musicians to be pastoral, to be ministers of the church. And so those, those musicians are not getting the support to be that to that segment of the congregation right now. And that's something I hope to see shift in the future. I hope that this might change in the future to realize like, no, these musicians can be pastoral partners, can be ministry partners in this and can minister to the, the people in their care, even in this, especially in this really, really difficult time. Especially in this time. Friends, I've, I've noticed that in my work, I, uh, in working with the choir at Eden in particular, We've spent more time checking in, more time, how are we, taking our, mm -hmm. taking our temperature emotionally and otherwise to, to make sure that we are present and then from then being present to be able to move forward. And I will tell you, our, our students here and many of our congregants who are either uh, burdened by new tasks in their jobs or are out of work, who are in different places of social isolation and family challenges and sometimes friends, family trauma uh, that we don't know all the details of. And yet we're asked to show up, to lead, to be the people that would invite others into singing praise and prayer. Um, we are holding a lot of responsibility and we're holding the souls of those that we're called to serve in a very tender and very gentle way. Um, so noticing that, that that is a challenge when we're not seen perhaps as also alongside our pastoral colleagues, also ministering in, in pastoral ways through our musical arts. Uh, that's a rich, rich noticing. Friends, I wanna take some time to just kind of stop for a moment if you don't mind. And I just wanna 
notice some things, some themes that have emerged before we go into our Q and A. I've heard us talking about authenticity and integrity. I've heard us talking about invitation and hospitality um, through our music and our worship. I've heard us talking about planning and preparation and the power of those two things. And I've also heard us talking about learning and, and growing um, and graceful learning and growing, if I might. Friends, as we kind of tease out those bigger themes of what we're learning, how God is in relationship with us and with with our communities as we're making worship online. Those are rich, powerful themes that don't just apply to what's happening in, in worship, but that apply to our lives and how we show up at day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. Um, friends, I wonder if there are some questions I, I've been noticing and I'm gonna scroll back just ever so slightly. We have time, I think, to answer two or three questions from among the community and I would uh, I wish we could take time to be with everybody today and to offer kind of one-on-one -on -one consultation. But I wanna tell you, both Dr. Tony and Sarah Baretza and myself, where we're all doing this work professionally. We're all connected to institutions like Eden Seminary and Clinton College and to, for, to congregations and institutions that Sarah is involved with that are asking these questions and engaging in conversation. And so we would be happy to um, follow up and or help lead you to other places you can find what you're looking for. We may not know where you're supposed to be, but you may. Uh, you may learn and we can, we can direct you to, through to someone else. Friends, are there any questions that you're holding or things, themes or things that have come up and I'm, I'm going to answer them one at a time. So the fastest typer wins here for, for at least for this first first question. But um, oh, Paul, Paul, this is Mary and I'm just going to interject because uh, Dr. Deborah Krauss has been uh, kind of uh, monitoring the chat. And um, yes. so I want to just speak a couple of the questions that have come up in the chat. Um, Several of them are um, very nuts and bolts how-to uh, questions. And so just to lift up one of those, Vanessa Myers Dudley is noting that music doesn't translate very well on Zoom. And so wondering about what platforms you think are best for making and sharing music and worship. So just practically speaking, Zoom is very challenging for singing together for the very simple fact that Zoom wants to hear you as a soloist and interrupts you uh, with other voices. So if you've tried it, and you should, just to, to feel the Pentecostal experience of, uh, of singing via Zoom, you can actually do very, uh, I would call it uh, asynchronous kinds of singing. Uh, we could sing certain kinds of melodies together uh, I'm part of a play group. We call it a play group that meets on Wednesdays with music that makes community. And we have been exploring how we could make better music with Zoom. And I actually would invite you, I'll, we'll put an invite at the end. We are having a free webinar next Wednesday at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And we're gonna be talking about some of those strategies that we've discovered. And that's on the music that makes community web page. But friends, many of our communities are also meeting on Facebook Live. Um, and Facebook Live has become a very helpful way for us to at least get what we're doing out to the community. The challenge seems to be knowing whether they're participating or not because we can't actually hear them. But I don't know about you, Sarah, Tony, I have been seeing incredible innovative thinking about how to use chatting during worship services as a way of the Lord be with you and the community types or says, and also with you, um, offering prayers of the people, offering really beautiful moments of, of connection. Uh, I would recommend friends, Ashley Goff, who is the pastor at Arlington Presbyterian Church. This past Easter Sunday, she had three moments in her sermon where the community could respond in a moment of quiet meditation to her sermon prompts, going through the story from John, it was powerful, not just to uh, myself play the inner script of what I was wanting to say, but to watch others' reflections and the richness of our exegetical discovery together as a community. Now that wasn't singing, 
but that sure felt like worship and a deepening relationship with text. Are there any other platforms or spaces that you've been noticing? What have you been noticing in Zoom and in Facebook, Sarah, Tony? Um, I want to suggest pre-recording and then releasing it as a, as a premiere event. So it is experienced as a live event. Services are experienced in a live kind of way. It has a start point. People pass the piece at the same time through the chat function. People are hopefully singing at the same time, hopefully singing loudly, those kinds of things. But it lets pre-recording lets you do so much more in terms of gathering safely from a distance. You know, we don't want our praise bands all together. We we don't no, we don't want a quartet together. We really we don't want that. And we can do so much musically, especially for, for us in lower tech churches. I am in a very low tech church. We recorded our first service with I'll show you my little podcasting mic. Um, because that's what we had. I brought it from my house, right? And, you know, we've made some improvements since then, but we, it's so much in, in terms of tech, it's so much easier to do a pre-recorded service and, and then experience it in a live fashion with those pauses, with that time for response, with that, you know, intentional engagement with, with each other, just technologically shifted into the past. Yeah. It's a lot easier. Thank you. Tony, what about you? I echo um, what Sarah just said. A lot, a lot of my friends and folks that I'm in conversation with, they are doing pre-recorded music. Um, it's safer. Um, it it comes across at a much um, a higher quality. And if you have the blessing of having an uh, an editor or someone who can uh, enhance the sound and tweak it um, after it's been recorded you know, it gives, it gives way for that to happen. And, um, you know, a lot of my uh, uh, folks that I, I speak with, when they come together, they record multiple services at one time in one city. And they will do any number three to four weeks ahead of time. Uh, yes, in one setting. Um, or I've also um, have some friends who have gone in the archives of some of their recorded services and uh, pulled excerpts of music and dropped them in to um, a current uh, worship, worship experience. So there are a variety of ways that people are approaching it. Wonderful. I, I think that feels so authentic to say, you know, this is our choir, this is our ensemble. It's not us today. But it's still us because I see some folks that are like, oh, I'm just going to pull this from YouTube. One, that's not legal. But two, that, that's not you. That's not your community. Whereas saying, you know, this is our choir. Sure, it's our choir last year, but it's us. It's our people. I also want to point out, too, that it's very interesting in terms of scale and approach. One of the things that I've loved so much in this time of, of, of online is that, yes, we can have our Sunday morning event where we can gather and be together and pre-record. But speaking to Vanessa, who's just offered in the chat, we can also have Zoom fellowship. We can do Zoom learning. We can do other kinds of singing and connecting as a community in Zoom that we can't do in Facebook Live. And so my wondering out loud is rather than prescribe a one size fits all, I wonder if we're listening to our own needs of our own communities and asking, hey, how are we gonna sing and connect and what are the ways in which younger older anywhere in between members are going to connect to specific experiences uh, that are valuable and connecting to them because this idea of making community of feeling like we're not just all different boxes on a screen but somehow part of something bigger than ourselves is also the beauty of worship um, and what we're we're hoping to make when we gather together as community of christ Deb, were there some other questions that you wanted to offer us or, or Mary? So I would just um, uh, highlight that there was questions we, you've been uh, asking about skills that we need. Um, and so one example of skills is being flexible. And so a personal story where the uh, intended recording didn't work and so there was somebody else who stepped in do you have any 
words of wisdom that you can share with us about mitigating those kinds of experiences? Here at Eden, we, uh, we were supposed to broadcast live from Zoom to Facebook Live on Maundy, our Maundy Thursday service. And of course, the technology didn't connect. And so in a last minute moment, we had to say, after three attempts, okay, we're just going to record it live through Zoom and then we'll upload it afterward. And we worshiped and we uploaded it. And it was, it was almost like having to marry to say, okay, this is good enough. This is good enough. And we gave our all in the moment of, of worship and we did what we could do. And, and that enough is a challenge for many of us. I find it myself as a perfectionist, quite a challenge. And I would say those of us who are musicians, we, we've got a little bit of that perfectionist gene in us, don't we? Uh, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't perfect our skills. But what other noticings around that are, how have you dealt with things not working out, not going the way we wanted? I've been encouraging people, don't wait until um, the hour of service to turn on your laptop or your iPad. Get on there 45 minutes to an hour or whatever it is that you're using. Don't assume the technology is going to cooperate that day. Uh, and especially for live experiences, I've seen some situations where it's, it, they, they've been caught by surprise that uh, you know, the connection was weak that particular Sunday. You've got to be prepared for that and um you know and be able to have a plan b and c and maybe even d if if necessary um but as a worship planner you've got to you've got to think think about that thank you dale for noticing that that congregations have been as sarah noticed earlier generally quite gracious and patient when things go awry the wi-fi drops in the middle of worship well we'll come back and we'll find it. I, had a, mm. I watched that happen at Arlington Presbyterian Church in the middle of the consecration of the elements for communion, the feed drop. And so they came back and they started over where they left off. And there was something so gracious about that. Sarah, any other words about that? Well, it's making me think that for those of us who do this on a weekly basis, we're used to fixing things on the fly, right? In our normal setting. And so we might not even think of it as a skill that we have. Because, oh, you know, I know what to do if, you know, the power goes out. I know what to do if, you know, all these different things happen. I know exactly what I would do, but I haven't practiced what do I do if the Wi-Fi goes out? What do I do if in this particular setting? And so it's kind of like playing the worst case scenario game. I don't know what to call it, where it's just like, okay, you know, what's going to fail? And, and imagine those plan B, C, D ahead of time and like literally sit and imagine well, what, what do I do if this happens? What do I do if this happens? Because we haven't been in this environment before. We haven't played with this very much in the way that we have after you know years of being a church musician or years of being a pastor. Planning and preparation. And that maybe even means being ready for imperfections and for things not going the way we hope. But friends, knowing that the grace of God, thanks be to God, is enough for all of us and is in no short supply. It will always be there. As so we... you, you all have been pastoring, uh, embodying what you've been saying, and so uh, with great gratitude uh, for that. I, I would just take this opportunity to put in a little plug uh, for a Facebook group that uh, was started by uh, some Eden students and faculty and staff at the uh, time that we shut our campus called uh, Leading Online. And so uh, it's a rich conversation about some of these both practical and uh, theological spiritual questions that uh, we've been discussing here. Um, we have come to almost the end of our time together. Um, and so um, before I turn it back to Paul for just a, a way of uh, ending our time together and our evening, I do want to give one other shout out for next week. Uh, at this time, Thursday, I've seen the picture of Clinton McCann, who's on our session. He's waving at us. Um, Dr. McCann will be leading us in a session um, on Psalms in the midst of pandemic. Um, and sharing some of his insights and his spirituality. 
So I turn it back over to you. Friends, we have been grateful. I am so grateful to Dr. Tony, to Sarah for this time, for their wisdom and expertise, for the breadth of what you've helped us to see and, uh, and the ways that you have, again, both of you are pastors in your musical uh, ministry. You are caring for deeply the communities that you serve. And I, I just want to say thank you for all you've offered to us. I want to share my screen. Katie, I don't, it says that I can't share it, but I want to share it. You've disabled screen sharing. I can do it now. Hey, friends, these, these are the websites of our friends who are with us, Sarah um, and Dr. Tony and myself. Friends, you can find on all their websites much more in terms of resources and very specific things. Sarah has got some excellent resources for COVID-19, for uh, connecting to congregational singing and organ music in particular, for congregations that are, are so inclined. Dr. Tony has a really active Instagram presence as well and is offering not just in his area, but nationally lifting up events that are happening around in the church and especially in, in black church contexts. Um, and friends, I am working with Music That Makes Community in a way that is connected to our ongoing um, being community together and sharing in how we make music and bridge the gap, uh, even in this digital space and, and become both learners and, and teachers at the same time. I figured, why don't we sing our way out? We began with an alleluia. Let's end with an alleluia with the same one. And friends, just to contextualize it, that, that song comes from George Mak Adana. I can't click but he's a Tosa musician from South Africa. And friends, that is a uh, Alleluia that was first heard sung at a funeral in the anti-apartheid movement, a powerful and, and beautiful um, musical emblem, friends. Of all of us go down to the dust, but even at the grave, we make our song. Alleluia, 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 our Easter words of hope and of promise. Um, friends, again, I'll invite you to listen and echo after me and then let's sing it once together. Listen first. Alleluia, alleluia. Try that. Alleluia, alleluia. Listen. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Let's sing together. Alleluia. Lift your hearts in praise. Alleluia, alleluia, halle, alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Alleluia, Christ is risen, friends. Go in peace and go in love. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, uh, Deb. And thank you, Eden, and our guests for allowing this space to happen. Go in peace. Go in peace.